Welcome to another Headline Roundup. It is October 10, 2022. I'm Dennis Tubergen, and you are watching a recorded presentation. Here's what we're going to talk about this week. The U.S. government debt officially just passed $31 trillion. Credit Suisse, are they on the ropes? We'll talk about that. The inflation problem is worldwide. This week, I interviewed for the radio show Mr. Murray Gunn from the UK, and I got Murray's take on inflation uh, as to what is going on from his perspective. The BRICS countries are looking at alternative currency options to the US dollar. Higher heating costs are inevitable this winter. And I want to talk about John Law, a character from the early 1700s, P.T. Barnum, who said there's one born every minute, and the Fed. So a lot to talk about. Let me jump in. The U.S. national debt now has officially surpassed $31 trillion for the very first time. This is an article published in the Washington Examiner by Brady Knox. The national debt of the United States blew past $31 trillion for the first time ever Tuesday, a grim milestone that comes amid soaring interest rates that threaten to strain the government's finances. It comes just nine months after the latest milestone of $30 trillion, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, and only five years after reaching $20 trillion. The unprecedented spree of government borrowing brought forth by the COVID-19 pandemic and further borrowing to stimulate the economy has helped contribute to the majority of this figure. This is a new record no one should be proud of, according to Maya McGinnis, who is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. In the past 18 months, we witnessed inflation rise to a 40-year high, Interest rates climbing in part to combat this inflation and several budget-busting pieces of legislation and executive actions. Just in 2022, Congress and the President have approved a combined $1.9 trillion in new borrowing, and President Biden has approved $4.9 trillion in new deficits since taking office. We are addicted to debt. Of course, that is stating the obvious. The U.S. debt reached new heights due to increased spending during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan following 9-11, and it's been on an upward, ever-rising trajectory ever since. McGinnis said this, even more troubling than where the debt stands now is where it's going. Our nation faces significant fiscal challenges in the near term. Medicare is only six years from insolvency, and Social Security insolvency is only 12 years away yet. They're spending money like crazy. Rising federal debt means greater interest costs for the government, making it harder to spend on other needs. And also, as the Fed is increasing interest rates, it makes it more difficult to finance the debt, finance the interest on the debt. Credit Suisse is a Swiss bank, and uh, they are in some trouble. This article starts by asking, will Credit Suisse pull through? Speculation surrounding the future of the Swiss banking giant has been going on for several months in the markets and business and other political circles, as well as on social networks. The number two Swiss bank and one of the world's largest banks is in deep trouble and is currently fighting for its survival. A negative outcome is likely to cause a shock similar to that caused by the bankruptcy of the U.S. bank Lehman Brothers in September of 2008. This event triggered one of the most serious financial and economic crises since the Great Depression. A year ago, Credit Suisse had market capitalization of over $22 billion. Today, about $10 billion. Credit Suisse shares fell 56.2% in one year down to now under $4 a share. Credit Suisse is, as the article said, experiencing a nightmare. At the time of the crisis, Credit Suisse shares had certainly fallen, but they were down only to the level of $45, now less than 10% of that. Credit Suisse shares began the month of October on October 3rd, 
as they ended the month of September in a sharp decline. They were down another 8% on that date. Spreads of the bank's credit default swaps have risen sharply in recent days. Credit default swaps, as most of you have been longtime viewers of Headline Roundup know, they're financial products. They are actually derivatives that really are a form of insurance against default, but they are unregulated. So a couple of good questions. What happened and how did we get here? Well, in recent days, according to the writer of the article, article understandably, employee morale at Credit Suisse has been gloomy. The bank has not yet renewed the contracts of certain contractors. Departures are no longer really replaced. The street has learned it is austerity cure. The talent is leaving. The bank has just lost one of its senior deal makers, Jens Walter, who joined Citigroup after 27 years with Credit Suisse. Walter was the global co-head of banking when he left. Another departure is the head of global credit products, Daniel McCarthy. Chief Executive Officer of Credit Suisse, Ulrich Kerner, said this, I am conscious there are, that there is lots of uncertainty and speculation both outside and within the company. While you will appreciate that I am unable to share details of our transformation plans before October 27, I also wanna make sure that you hear from me directly during this challenging period. I will therefore be sending a regular update to you all until then. In this memo seen by the street, the CEO explained this is a critical moment for the bank and warn employees that the rumors and speculations will continue and become even louder. Now, the inflation that we're all experiencing is not just in the United States. Arguably, Europe is experiencing similar inflation. This article by the Associated Press published September 30 said inflation in the European countries using the euro currency has broken into double digits as prices for electricity and natural gas soar, signaling a looming winter recession for one of the globe's major economies as higher prices undermine consumer spending power. Consumer prices in the 19-country Eurozone rose a record 10% in September from a year earlier, up from an annual 9.1% in August. European Union Statistics Agency Eurostat reported this on Friday. A year ago, inflation was only 3.4%. Price increases were beyond what market analysts had expected and they're at their highest level since re record keeping for the euro started in 1997. So the, since the euro has been around, inflation has not been at these levels. Energy prices are up more than 40% from a year ago. Food, alcohol, and tobacco up nearly 12%. The article quotes a 64-year-old trainer and coach for staff development who they found met, I should say, out shopping in Cologne, Germany. She said, I'm already looking for more special offers. I don't throw away so much so quickly, so I've become a lot more economical with food. And this morning, I've turned down the heating in the rooms again. Inflation has been fueled by study cutbacks in supplies of natural gas from Russia and bottlenecks in getting supplies of raw materials and parts as the global economy bounces back from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Russian cutbacks have sent gas prices soaring to the point where energy intensive businesses such as fertilizer and steel say they can no longer make some of the products at a profit. I reported previously that the largest steel maker in Germany closed its doors. Meanwhile, high prices for utility bills, food, and fuel are leaving consumers with less money to spend on other things. That's the main reason economists are predicting a recession. I believe Europe, and I believe the United States, as I have indicated, are probably already in recession. In fact, here in the U.S., we have already met the technical definition of a recession. The European Central Bank is raising interest rates to combat inflation. Uh, however, they are not raising interest rates fast enough, just like the Fed, to make any significant difference, in my view. Jessica Hines, who's a senior Europe economist at Capital Economics, said that the recent inflation reading 
was likely to be a matter of, quote, grave concern for the European Central Bank. They have their next meeting coming up, incidentally, October 27. Higher interest rates make it more expensive for people and businesses to borrow, invest, and spend. That dampens demand for goods. And what we're not talking about here is not only our um, interest rates um, going up, prices are going up as well. So it's a double whammy. This is a debt-driven recession versus an inventory-driven recession. The European Central Bank has the same 2% inflation target as the Fed. And I believe that, as I talked about on my radio program this week, that both the Fed and the European Central Bank uh, will not get inflation back to this 2% target for a very long time. Central banks around the world are rapidly raising rates. Well, I think they are raising rates, but probably not far enough and not fast enough to tame inflation, but they will accomplish an economic slowdown. That's already starting as stock prices have plummeted and real estate is starting to show a lot of weakness. European officials call the natural gas cutbacks from Russia energy blackmail aimed at pressuring and dividing European governments over Western sanctions and their support for Ukraine. The rising gas prices that have resulted mean higher heating bills and higher electricity costs because natural gas is used to generate electricity to heat homes and to run factories. European energy ministers on Friday, this would be a week ago Friday as you are watching this webcast, adopted a windfall levy on profits by fossil fuel companies. So basically they're saying, if you're making too much money, we are going to take them. We're gonna take that money rather. Well, individual countries have also allocated hundreds of billions to provide relief to households and businesses. Consumer prices in Germany rising by nearly 11% hitting double digit inflation rate for the first time in decades, the government announced plans to spend up to 200 billion euros, which is about that many dollars, to help with surging gas bills. Trouble is they have to create currency to do that. Chancellor Olaf Scholz said Thursday that the government was reactivating an economic stabilizing fund previously used during the global financial crisis. Kristen Schrader, someone else who this article writer bumped into while shopping at this market in Cologne, was less worried about fuel prices, but said that, quote, you start to think about which rooms need to be heated in the flat and try to explain to the children that we only play in one room. Now, while the dollar is relatively strong against other currencies and the term relatively there should be underlined, the dollar is not gaining an absolute purchasing power, but relative to the trading partners of the US, the dollar has been strong. Despite that, the BRICS countries are looking at potentially an alternate currency to the US dollar. This was published in Business News the headline, BRICS holds talks on reserve currency. The group is reportedly set to develop alternative payment mechanisms to shift away from the US dollar and the Euro. Here's a bit from the article. The BRICS countries are working on establishing a new reserve currency to better serve their economic interests. Ambassador at large of Russia's foreign ministry uh, said this week, it will be based on a basket of currencies of the five nation bloc. The possibility and prospects of setting up a common single currency based on a back, basket of currencies in the BRICS, BRICS countries is being discussed. So the BRICS, country, BRICS countries, excuse me, are looking for a way to go around the U.S. dollar and not have to hold U.S. dollars for trade. The diplomat who went unnamed in this article stated that member states are, quote, actively studying mechanisms to exchange financial information to develop a reliable alternative for international payments. In an effort to reduce reliance on the dollar and the euro, BRICS is set to 
build a joint financial infrastructure that will, will enable a reserve currency to be created. I've reported on this in the past. The BRICS countries, incidentally, as the article points out, this is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That comprises, from my research, about 30% of world economic output. BRICS had previously said it was working on establishing a joint payment network to cut reliance on the Western financial system. The member countries have also be, been increasing the use of local currencies and mutual trade. Home heating costs, as we're now entering a heating season again, an energy group says we can all look forward to heating costs that are 17% higher this winter. This article is by Brian Young. Winter is coming and experts are predicting it will be an expensive one for American households. The average U.S. household heating bill is expected to increase by 17.2% this winter compared to last year. Families had already faced higher than average electric bills last winter due to inflation, and this year there will be no improvement. The National Energy Assistance Directors Association assist state agencies under the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program in distributing federal assistance to help low-income families pay their utility bills. The Energy Association expects that the average winter heating bill will increase from $1,025 to $1,202. Heating prices have risen over the past two years to more than 35%. That's the highest rate in 10 years. The total cost of heating would increase from $127.9 billion to about $150 billion. And of course, lower income households will feel that the most. The rise in home energy costs this winter will put millions of lower income families at risk of falling behind on their energy bills. And they'll be put in a situation they have to choose between paying for food, medicine, rent, or energy. In fact, I reported that energy bill delinquents, delinquencies are at an all-time high as well, just a few weeks ago. John Law, P.T. Barnum, and the Fed. This is my last topic for this week. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on it. This op-ed was put together by Sovereign Man. I thought it hit the nail right on the head. John Law will be explained in the article. Many of you have been longtime viewers of the Headline Roundup newscast, or perhaps many of you who've listened to the uh, podcast and radio program for a period of time are familiar with John Law. I've talked about him frequently. P.T. Barnum was an interesting character who said that there's a sucker born every minute. And... I threw in P.T. P. Barnum because as I read this, his name popped to mind. And of course, we'll talk about the Fed. Sovereign man started by saying the people who engineered record inflation now want to control cryptocurrency. And there's a huge parallel here to John Law. And as I've often stated, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. So I want to give you just a bit of the backstory here because there are many parallels and it's educational. On the 1st of May in the year 1716, a swashbuckling Scottish entrepreneur was making the pitch of a lifetime to the head of the French government in Paris. Now, this guy's name was John Law. By all accounts, he was an incredibly charismatic guy. He had a flamboyant, larger-than-life personality. In fact, he ended up in Paris after he left London under suspicious circumstances after he was sentenced to hang because he was sentenced to a he was sentenced to death for shooting an opponent in a duel that came about as a result of his womanizing. So a very, very interesting character. Sovereign man said he was something like Adam Newman, formerly of WeWork, the kind of person who could talk anyone into anything. And that's certainly uh, is congruent with what I have read and studied about John Law. Now, John Law was pitching an entirely new financial system. King Louis XIV had just died. France was in terrible ruin because Louis XIV, although he was a popular king, 
He was popular because of his giveaways that were funded by accumulating debt. Not unlike where we find ourselves today. The situation was dire. It was so dire, in fact, there, were hard, there was hardly any gold left in the French treasury. So the new head region of the government was desperate for a solution. Law, who I have researched, met the Duke actually gambling in Paris. Law made the Duke a proposal that said, Duke, give me a special banking license, and in return, I'll create a new monetary system. I'll create a paper currency system that will bring more gold into the treasury. The Duke was desperate and agreed, and a few weeks later, John Law's bank was in business. Now, Law was a pretty smart guy. He, he knew that people would love the idea of paper currency, and within a year, his paper banknotes were circulating widely throughout the French economy, and the government even accepted them for tax payments. Law made this paper currency even more attractive after he took over the Mississippi Company. Now, the French Mississippi Company, the article writer said, was something like the Dutch East India Company. It was a private enterprise that had received a royal monopoly over all the land and resources in France's American colonies. As soon as Law got rights to the French Mississippi Company, he did an IPO. But he said, if you use this new paper currency, you can buy the shares for 75% of the share price. You get a 25% discount. Well, that worked really, really well. In fact, it was so popular, law became very, very popular. He was even offered bribe, sex, and political favors from French nobles if they'd be given an opportunity to buy a few extra shares. So politics really hasn't changed too much in the last 300 years. Voltaire, in fact, I quote Voltaire too. Voltaire was the philosopher who said that currency always returns to its intrinsic value. And in the case of a fiat currency, that is zero. Voltaire wrote this about John Law, quote, I myself saw him pass through the galleries of the Palace Royal, followed by dukes and peers, marshals of France, bishops of the church. Law was the guy in France. The Mississippi Company, was like many of today's IPOs that had never made a profit. Hardly anyone was living in the southern colonies that France had in America. There was virtually no trade or commerce going on, yet the share price soared. It's the same thing that happened with many companies around the, tech, uh, around the time of the tech stock bubble. And again, today, companies that had never made a profit, having share prices run up. The government of France even tried deporting criminals to America, trying to increase the population of the colonies. Maybe also some parallels to today. They offered hundreds of acres of land for free to anyone that would go, yet it still didn't work. Eventually, the French public woke up to the truth. There would be no gold, no gems, and no riches coming from the Mississippi Company, and the stock price began to collapse. Law tried to prop things back up by creating more currency backed by nothing, but all he ended up doing was creating inflation. Prices everywhere rose. In fact, by May of 1720, retail prices in France had doubled. France was experiencing full-blown hyperinflation and people panicked. They began to feverishly sell off their Mississippi company shares and trade their paper currency for any real asset they could get their hands on. Now, there are some examples here as well, but suffice it to say that this currency creation led to massive inflation. Well, at the peak of all this insanity, the French government gave John Law a promotion. He became the Controller General. In other words, the guy who created the biggest financial bubble in French history was now put in charge of the government's finances. Now, here's the parallel. 
there were a group of central bankers discussing cryptocurrency at a recent conference in Paris. The heads of the U.S. Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank participated in a, in a panel discussion that, for anyone who actually understands crypto, can only be described, described as hilarious. Naturally, they started with the old anti-crypto tropes, talking about the lack of transparency, transparency and how criminals use crypto. These are completely laughable points. I agree. Criminals use iPhones, American Express, and J.P. Morgan Chase as well. Should we cancel those too? As far as crypto's lack of transparency, the opposite is true. Every Bitcoin transaction is traceable on the blockchain for the entire world to see. It's an open architecture spreadsheet, for lack of a better term. Yet, with every passing sentence these bankers demonstrated, they knew absolutely nothing about crypto and quite possibly banking, too. At one point, they slammed stable coins that didn't have a one-to-one -one backing. Stable coins are specialized tokens that represent like one U.S. dollar per token. So there's got to be a dollar in circulation for every stable coin in circulation. So the obvious question is, if you need a one-to-one -one reserve standard for stable coins, why are bankers allowed to operate with a 10% reserve? So here's a group of bankers operating with a 10% reserve saying you need one-to-one -one backing for stable coins. In other words, these people are perfectly fine that commercial banks gamble most of their customers' money, and they're outraged when a few stable coins aren't reserved by 100%. But they should be equally outraged that commercial banks are reserved at a rate of 10%. The biggest laughs, though, according to the article writer, took place when these central bankers started talking about rolling out their own digital currencies. The Fed wants to create a dollar coin. The European Central Bank wants a euro token. The article writer, I think, accurately says, this is truly rolling on the floor, laugh out loud, loud funny, given that these people have no clue about technology. The Federal Reserve's most important payment system, Fed ACH, which processes over 50 million transactions per day, still takes two to three days for payments to clear. It's so outdated, it's as if they're sending satchels full of cash via Pony Express. So it's a modern day version of what happened in France in the early 1700s. And P.T. Barnum was right, there's one born every minute. I believe that having some tangible assets in your portfolio moving ahead will still be key, many of you who are watching today's webcast already own some gold and silver. Uh, I think now is a terrific opportunity to consider adding some metals to your portfolio. Um, I would be cautious and not get more than 20% of your portfolio in metals. But if you're under that now, I think is a good time to do that. If you'd like to talk more, you can give John Awi a call at the office, 866-921-3613. Thanks for watching. I'll be back again live next week.